us about that. Well, thank you. So thank you for everybody for being at my talk, and especially the people that don't have to be here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about how invertebrates are affected by fish presence in streams. So, so this study was done in Bankhead National Forest, which is northwest Alabama. It's roughly, I think, 180,000 acres, give or take. Um, and it's above, it's above Birmingham, so it's pretty far away. Um, so some of the streams that I worked in are relatively small. They're called headwater streams, so they're about as wide as this table sometimes, the widest parts. So about two to four meters um, in width, and you know sometimes less than a foot, um, eight inches of water going through the stream. So these are really small. <coughs> So the goal of this study is to see how these invertebrates are being affected by fish. And so one of the main mechanisms that we are looking at is something called drift. And drift is just the downstream transport of organisms in the water. So um, drift can be kind of a natural process. Um, invertebrates that are in an area with like a high population, they'll let go of the, the substrate in the stream and float downstream. Um, kind of reach areas that aren't as colonized. Um, if there's an area that doesn't have a lot of nutrients, they'll let go and hopefully land in some place that has a little bit higher nutrient uh, availability. Um, but also, in the literature, it's been shown that in the presence of a predator, especially a vertebrate predator, um, these bugs will selectively let go in like a, if a fish tries to eat them and it's not successful, they'll run away by letting go in the stream. And you'll see kind of changes in their um, densities and their taxa richness and even in, in when they're drifting. So that's going to be some of our, our questions. Who's drifting? So we're looking at the, the taxa um, or the, the, the family level taxa that are in the drift. Uh, we're also looking at how many. So we're looking at densities of invertebrates that are drifting. And we're looking at when they're drifting. So um, seeing if there's shifts in, you know, mostly, mostly drifting in daylight, mostly drifting at nighttime, or if it's just kind of an even, steady level of drift. So for the methods of this of this study, we use things called drift nets. They're specialty made drift, uh, specialty made nets that you put in um, put in a uh, stream. Uh, for this project, we chose streams with waterfalls. Uh, waterfalls being barriers for fish dispersal upstream. Um, so we took a, we did this a 24 hour sampling method, so we took a sample every three hours, so we got the camp out next to the stream, um, every three hours, you know, take the net out, empty it out, uh, put the bugs and organic material in a bag, um, which is really fun, but that like 3 a.m. sampling time was really, really rough. Um, so we had five streams, uh, we were going for six, but Later in the season, everything went dry, so we lost our sixth stream. Um, so we had five streams. Uh, because there's a waterfall, we had some streams that had fish downstream of a waterfall and fish upstream of a waterfall. And we did that just to try and collect any information. If the waterfall was uh, would be causing an effect for, for bug uh, drifting. Um, so we had two reaches that were fishless, um, unfortunately. So it's not really a balanced model for most of this, unfortunately. So when we take all the organic material and bugs um, in bags, we take it back to a lab and we start picking through the organic material and identifying bugs, um, which you can see here. So in total, roughly 44,000 uh, individuals were collected, most of them being insects, um, so things with six legs or little grubby looking things. Um, we also found mites, which are actually arachnids, uh, we found crustaceans, you know, snails and clams. Well, not as many snails, but mostly clams. Uh, we also found little sites from our scuds. So, looking at who is drifting, um, this is just a, a metric that that's pretty commonly used in biology. It's the Shannon Wiener Index for Diversity. Um, the two bars with stars; those were our fishless sections. So you can see here, there's really not much difference in the diversity uh, using the Shannon Wiener Index. Um, between streams and also in blue is upstream, uh, red is downstream. So you can see there's really not much difference in the, the, the actual taxa, the actual species of 
invertebrates that we're finding in each stream. So another way to look at it is the Simpson's reciprocal index. Um, so the reason you use those two different indices is one's more heavily um, dependent on rare taxa, the other is more heavily uh, influenced by uh, common taxa. So you kind of have to look at both of these at the same time. Uh, you can see that, again, we're not really seeing much difference uh, between all the streams and even between fish and fishes or upstream and downstream. So we wanted to see how many invertebrates were drifting, so this is going to be like densities. Um, you can see fishless and fish reaches. Um, there's really not much difference. There's a lot of noise when it comes to this. Um, so this was upstream and downstream of a waterfall. I also wanted to look at it of uh, just upstream reaches because it's not necessarily balanced. In a perfect study, you would have fishless upstream, fishless downstream, fish upstream, fish downstream, and fishless upstream and fishless downstream. Um, but because that doesn't happen in nature, um, I wanted just to take out some variation of upstream downstream, so I just looked at upstream fish and upstream fishless sections. Um, and you can see there's not a heck of a lot of difference um, when, you, when you're talking about the densities of invertebrates drifting at each time. So. so this was a pretty interesting graph. So this is looking at <coughs> densities or proportions of taxa uh, drifting in daylight, uh, the yellow being daylight, uh, the orange being kind of that um, intermediate time. So the area where I was collecting is pretty hilly. So as the sun's going down, it gets behind a hill. Um, the sky's still bright, but we're, we're in a pretty good shaded area. These streams are being heavier streams, have a lot of trees. Um, so it's actually fairly dark at these times than black being nighttime. You see that most of the invertebrates are drifting at nighttime. Um, this is true in whether there's fish there, whether there's not fish there, whether it's, you know, depending on each stream, you're seeing the same trends in all of them. So, in summary, there's vast amounts of invertebrates drifting downstream, obviously. Um, so looking at it just as a, a, a community level, at a course scale, we're not seeing any differences. Um, so what we did is we had to take things down to a finer scale and actually look at taxa, like say there's a midge, um, one specific kind of midge in all the streams, that's where the actual differences are going to be, not at the community level. Um, and if this is something that you're interested in, I'm going to be giving my defense talk probably later this month, which I'll start getting into the actual nitty-gritty statistics of all of this. Um, but yeah, so if you're interested, come to that. That's when I'll actually be teasing out each individual taxa. And I'd like to thank Dr. Tali Jordan and everyone else that helped out with this project. Um, it ran for about two months that I was doing this. Um, so there's a lot of people involved, 24 hour sampling, um, so yeah, any questions? Hi Christian, this is actually you and Jessica. This photography is just exceptional on the level. Is that something? How did you do that? So, is that a so yeah, we just sort of put a camera up to the ocular and the microscope. Um, so these are all from dissecting scopes. There's, you know, Procoptera, Tricopteras. Here, there's Femoropteras. Um, go back. This is really nice detail. So that center image right there, um, that is a, I believe that's a locus area. It's a, it's a caddisfly larvae that was done under a compound scope. So when you're identifying a when you're identifying a lot of invertebrates, I don't know if there's any invert people here. <laughs> so you're, you're literally counting hairs on lips. So if you're dealing with some things like a midge, um, you actually have to crush their heads and look at their teeth, um, which thank goodness I wasn't going that far. But I, I left everything at family level identification, um, which there's some you know, people that say that's not the greatest thing to do just because you lose a lot of resolution. Um, but you know, for the sake of a master's and timelines, and because I had so many samples and so many individuals, going through and trying to identify everything to genus level um, is, is a pain. And don't, uh, oh, yep. Yeah. Don't leave a slide. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not 
is familiar with the Simpson and the Shen Wing area. You can get you you have like an error bar associated with those, right? I do. Okay. And so what's the multiple comparison test that you're going to be using to send your head to the stats? So what's the So we use a lot of Jitter linear models looking yeah, at okay. cash GLM? Yeah. Um, so we also looked at how the um, the proportions of the taxa. Uh, we look at how proportions of, say, a um, lepticera is in the drift versus what it is in the bentos. Um, so we're going to be running scatter plots and things like that for, for trying to determine. Would y'all um, consider like a principal component or something like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you have any you know idea of, of, of how to do this better, I, I would be really interested in, in talking more about that just because it's. It's something I'm interested in and, and trying to you know, figure out the best way to look at these things. Well, I don't know what's standard for this. So. Yeah. Sometimes the more complicated yeah. the model is, and actually make something that uh, uh, safeguard model may not capture, right? Like, it may not be necessary to become overcomplicated. Right. Like, right. Right. Yeah, keep, keep it to the simplest one you can. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's determining what is the simplest thing is mm -hmm. that you're you know, not just ignoring other, other ways to look at it. What's the saying? Model should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. <laughs> uh, yeah. Other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker again.